Well, one of the first things that the Federal Reserve needs to do before it gets to the point where it can institute another round of open market operations such as quantitative easing is it needs to figure out how much money is available in circulation. Now, the term for the amount of money in circulation is what we refer to as the money supply. And the Federal Reserve tries to essentially get a gauge on how much money is currently in circulation so it knows ultimately how much money it has to add to it or how much money it has to of course remove from it if inflationary pressures are a primary concern. And so there are two primary methods that the Federal Reserve uses to gauge how much money is available in circulation and they just vary in terms of liquidity meaning how quickly those funds can be converted to cash or are cash in their present form. And so the first method of measuring the amount of money in circulation is what we call M1. And M1 includes a couple different things. Uh, the first thing it does is it does include cash. Uh, cash, of course, is the most liquid form of currency. And the Federal Reserve can measure this by how much money has been printed by the Treasury. And it's essentially kept track of how much money is available in circulation. And the next things it looks at are what we have in checking accounts. And of course, a checking account is essentially a digital kind of account of what we have on file. We know that banks don't necessarily keep this money on file for us. They're responsible for saving a certain percentage and then they obviously get revenue by loaning out the remainder of that. And so checking accounts are included in M1. The next thing that's included are traveler's checks. And traveler's checks aren't necessarily used very frequently unless, of course, you travel. But they are guaranteed funds. They're very similar to checks in terms of they share many characteristics. But there are some nuances and they are a little bit more secure. And they're predominantly used when people travel and go out overseas and those different types of things. Uh, so those are the items that are all included under M1. As you can see, they're very, very liquid forms of currency. Now, uh, the Federal Reserve uses predominantly what we refer to as M2 as a way of gauging the money supply. And there are a couple of differences with regards to, in comparison from M1 to M2. Uh, the first thing that M2 includes is ultimately everything in M1. And so everything that I already included here is going to be included in M2. So we already have cash, we already have checking accounts, we already have traveler's checks. But we're going to add a few different things on top of that. In addition to those three items, we're also going to include savings accounts. We're also going to include money market mutual funds or money market accounts. And lastly, we're going to be including certificates of deposit, commonly referred to as CDs. And the important thing with CDs is we're going to include CDs that are less than a year. And we want these to be fairly liquid. And of course, with certificates of deposit, as you know, you can, of course, break the, the agreement to hold your money for a certain period of time. Of course, you incur penalties, uh, but we only include them for less than one year as being relatively liquid. Uh, so the Federal Reserve now predominantly uses M2, this figure right here, as a way of gauging how much money is available in circulation. And the reason that they use predominantly M2 has to do with changes in technology. Um, originally, it was much more difficult to transfer money from you know, your savings account to a checking account. Uh, now we can go online and with a couple of keystrokes, we can transfer money immediately. We can gain access to those funds very easily. Uh, same thing with money market accounts and certificates of deposit, of course. Uh, so M2 is considered to be a more reliable or realistic gauge of how much money is available in circulation. Uh, so we use that for all intents and purposes. Now, one of the things that you might be asking is, well, why don't we include things like credit cards, for example? Uh, they're a, 
uh, readily used form of payment. In fact, here in the U.S., they're used very heavily. Uh, we accumulate a, a large degree of, of credit card debt. And so because it is an option to be used as far as a form of payment, uh, why don't we include that when assessing the amount of money in circulation? And that's a very, very good question and one that comes up uh, relatively frequently. And the reason that we don't necessarily include credit cards in the money supply is because first, they have to be paid back with funds that are going to come from M1 or M2. And so because of that, it really it's it's borrowed money and it's not necessarily money that is readily available that you have at your disposal now do you can you certainly use it of course but in order to pay it back you're going to include funds from both M1 and M2 uh, which is going to give you a very unrealistic figure uh, the next thing that you look at besides obviously having to pay it back with funds that are already going to be in circulation is many credit cards also do not have a limit and so when you're trying to quantify what the significance of that is that can become very very difficult when you have a credit card with a very very high limit or no limit at all it just becomes very very difficult to try and and quantify well what is the value of the money supply then and it's it's almost impossible to determine uh, and so for all intents and purposes typically M2 is utilized because it's viewed as being a more realistic gauge of how much money ultimately is in circulation